Coming up today on Issues in Education, the future of healthcare and health education. We're joined by an FSU professor who's advising the country about what should happen next. Welcome to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, alongside my co-host, the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron. Joining us today is Dr. Jill Quidogno. Professor Quidogno is not only the Mildred and Claude Pepper Eminent Scholar Chair in Social Gerontology at FSU, but she has also been recently named a fellow to the Institute of Medicine. The IOM is one of the four prestigious organizations that make up what is known as the National Academies. Professor, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So, what is Social Gerontology? Well, social gerontology is a very interdisciplinary field that includes sociology, which is my discipline, um, history, political science, economics, social welfare, and it's the study of the social consequences of biological aging. So we know that people age and that their bodies change, but there are numerous social factors associated with this. For instance, um, population aging which occurs um, is occurring in the United States and most Western European countries places pressure on programs like Social Security and Medicare mm -hmm. and so that's the macro kind of story but then there's also how that affects individuals and how it affects their lives and their families um, an individual issue might be there are many more women in the labor force now than there were 30 or 40 years ago. How do women plan for retirement? What are the uh, effects of couples jointly retiring? Is it um, a problem for a married couple if one person retires, let's say the husband retires first and the wife is still working, does she expect to come home to a clean house or a sink full of dirty dishes. Um, so there, there are many, many aspects, grandparenting, um, family relationships to siblings who've not gotten along maybe earlier in their life, um, mm -hmm. when they have to work together to take care of an aging parent, um, what are the factors that determines how that goes. So we're interested in all those kinds of issues from the very macro societal level to the individual um, quality of care and familial now, where relationships. Do you, where does your research specifically like? Because usually people focus on one aspect in their own um, discipline. So w what research areas are you interested in now or have been? I've, I've had two main lines of research. Um, one is more historical and I've traced the origins of the Social Security program. Um, I looked at the uh, background and how we got the war on poverty during Lyndon Johnson's administration and, and the, the most lasting achievement of that, which is Medicare. Um, I'm also interested in long-term care and that's much more um, applied is the quality of long-term care for frail older people. I worked on one study here with, um, I had a postdoctoral fellow here working with me and a number of our grad students worked on that project and a well, part of it was that we had a conference here at Florida State that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on um, nursing home care and so we had people from all over the country come here and talk about what makes good quality nursing home care and then we also had another study funded by the National Institute on Aging um, and I must say I didn't realize what I was getting in for when we started this. We studied assisted living facilities which are taking over from nursing home care. People much prefer assisted living which is more freedom, more independence over nursing homes. And so they've been, they've been growing and outpacing nursing homes in the growth. And so we said we would study nursing homes all over, um, I'm sorry, assisted living facilities all over Florida without really realizing what that meant. When you go to Tampa, they're not lined up in a row on one street. Um, you know, and some are in Lake City and little tiny back roads. And so um, we interviewed over 600 people in different assisted living facilities all over the state. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things that we found was that some of them look like luxurious hotels and some of them are small and plain. But what mattered most was not whether there were big chandeliers in the lobby, but whether people felt like it was their home, whether the staff made it a homey, caring place, and of course, food. <laughs> and so how did you get interested in this topic? Was there some event in your, your life or was this something that happened slowly? Um, 
I was, when I was in graduate school, uh, I had a fellowship that part of the requirement was that you do something related to aging. And I had worked on a research project before graduate school looking at, in rural Kansas, um, how communities cared for their elderly residents. And so I was interested in aging. And I didn't know if this would be something I would pursue for my whole career. But once I started, I found there were so many important issues that, that mattered so much to people in their families, not just as an academic issue, but I mean, for me, my own parents, I took care of my mother for 13 years, and um, my fa and she was in a nursing home for much of that time. And then my father was just about to move into assisted living before he died. So I know what people experience, how confusing and difficult it can be to find good sources of care because a lot of times people don't plan but wait for an emergency, um, a fall, a broken hip, and then they're scurrying to find yeah. care. So I, I feel like it's a critical issue that affects every family. What attracted you? You started your career at the University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to Florida State University, other than the weather? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that turned out to be actually a very good thing that I didn't anticipate at the time. But when I look at the weather map now and see what the weather is in Kansas, I'm definitely glad to be here. Um, it was just a wonderful job opportunity uh, to hold an endowed chair in Claude Pepper's name as someone I admired from afar. And um, he was actually still alive when I came here and so I got a chance to meet him. Um, when we held the conference on nursing home care, he came and gave the keynote speech and talked for 50 minutes without a single note. Uh, and he was 89 years old at the time. Sounds, sounds like something I'd <laughs> like to aspire <laughs> to. Yes. Oh. Yeah. You know, so you were elected as a member of uh, one of the National Academies, the Institute uh, of Medicine. What does that mean? Uh, I was very, surprised. I had no idea this was in the works and I just got first an email. Um, you know, and sometimes you trash emails from <laughs> people you don't know yeah. and luckily <laughs> I didn't do that and I opened it up and I was astounded. Um, it's a very prestigious honor to be a member of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, it, it's an organization that is was founded by Congress over a hundred years ago to advise um, both the federal government and the nation on key health policy issues. And they put out um, white papers and reports and whole conferences. I, maybe you've seen on the news recently, they were uh, a, a report that the Institute of Medicine put out on how much calcium and vitamin D people should take. Mm -hmm. um, other recent reports they've done are on comparative effectiveness medicine, in other words, um, is knee surgery effective? Um, what kinds of things work and what what don't? Um, and so I'll be, uh, they, it's divided into 12 different sections and my section will be health policy and I don't know yet what I'll be working on but I'm looking forward to my first meeting will be next October. And are there other sociologists that are part of the Institute there are, of Medicine there are in the policy group? Yeah. Yes, right. Um, that's probably where a lot of the sociologists end up but it's very interdisciplinary. There are also um, there are many physicians and there are health services researchers, economists, mm -hmm. um, almost every field you can think of. What does this recognition mean for for you and for the university, and as far as, as I what I think it means. it's a, you know it's a wonderful um, opportunity for me to get more involved in policy issues, which is all my research has some policy implications, whether it's the historical studies or the um, more applied long-term care research. Uh, I'm always interested in what possible policies might be improved or changed, or what are the limits? You know, what can and what can't we do? Um, and so this is, this is a more direct link to policy um, because members of Congress commission papers from the mm -hmm. Institute of Medicine and instead of publishing in professional journals, I would have a more direct voice. So I'm really excited about that. And so that, that, that voice and what you just described fits very well with the book that you wrote in 2005, One Nation Uninsured. And which focuses on why um, the U.S. doesn't have a national health care. I noticed in reading the book that you, um, you really talk about the role of sort of major 
social institutions, whether, uh, whether it's the medical community or the insurance community or the force of, of labor or people's feelings about the importance of, of the state. Would you add another chapter now that something was passed? <laughs> um, I, I think I would almost have to, and, I, and in fact I'm taking notes and um, planning to do some interviews the next time I'm in Washington to follow up on what has happened under the Obama administration, which is a phenomenal feat, actually, and, and especially because we read every day in the paper about other nations cutting back benefits, you know, riots in France over raising the retirement age in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. and, and here we are adding a new entitlement program, basically, although there are many, many complex pieces to it. And that was one of, one of the reasons why I got interested in the health policy. I had, you know, worked on Social Security, worked on the war on poverty, and there, there was the health was always kind of out there in the background, but I didn't want to take it on because it seemed really complicated to figure out and I wasn't sure where the story would take me. But President Roosevelt thought about including national health insurance in the Social Security Act, but there was a great deal of opposition from the American Medical Association and from business groups and he decided he didn't want to risk the whole Social Security Act. Uh, for that, and then um, President Truman, that was a big part of his fair deal was national health insurance, and when that was killed, um, and Claude Pepper, by the way, lost the election mm -hmm. in 1950, partly and a large part because he was a supporter of Truman's national health insurance plan, mm -hmm. um, and so in the meantime, then we had uh, the unions went for private benefits in their collective bargaining agreements, and by the 1960s, we had. Uh, a whole layer of private benefits that through the employment contract and that included many non-union um, companies followed suit and so that took a big part of the political constituency for national health insurance out of the picture. Um, most working age people were covered through their employers. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, sorry to follow this just a little bit more, so really what you're saying is that if I have a big pool of labor and their needs get satisfied, say, th th through, through unions or working for large corporations. And then I take another large segment of the population, which is elderly, that has Medicare. The impetus to do something for people that are uninsured changes dramatically because just the numbers of people that you've removed that right. don't feel threatened anymore. Right. You've, yeah. you've taken out the major constituencies. And it was actually the trade unions that pushed for Medicare because they um, it was expensive for them to try to cover their retired groups in their collective bargaining, and then they'd have to give up on wages. Um, and so Medicare, you know, took all people over 65 out of the fight. And then we also had um, disability insurance added later, and people on disability benefits are eligible for Medicare as well. And then we had Medicaid, which is low income people, um, low poor people, but also children um, in lower income households. And then the bulk of nursing home care is paid for through Medicaid as well. So we've got this complicated system with uh, you know, many different types of private benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, um, the whole set of institutions that would be impossible to race, erase and start over. Mm -hmm. um, President Obama did what was almost the only possible solution was to try to deal with all those pieces. Do you see Florida right now as better or worse shape than the rest of the country? I mean, Florida is kind of the bellwether state for the rest of the country because we have the largest population, 65 and older. And so what goes on in Florida is, is of interest to national policymakers. And Florida's already dealing with many of the issues that the rest of the country will be facing, um, particularly in long-term care. Florida um, has more regulation of nursing homes than many other states in the South. Florida's had this phenomenal growth of assisted living facilities, which other states are following. So what? What goes here is really where the rest of the nation will be heading. It's a very, very important issue for our state. So now here you are in the midst of, of providing 
tremendous amount of advice to the nation on very important issues and and your election to the National Academies will probably only further further the the value of your advice and people asking you for your advice and you're in the midst of an intensive research program how do students fit in into well, the, your life the students are a big part of everything that I do um, on all of my research projects my graduate students have worked with me um, whether it's helping to gather historical data they did a lot of the interviews when we um, we took caravans of grad students all around the state uh, interviewing in the assisted living facilities and um, almost all of the papers that I've published in the last 10 years have had a graduate student as a co-author and that's really one of my major goals as a as a teacher is to um, help my students learn what it means to be a researcher and to succeed in their careers and to help them get good jobs and undergraduates too I had um, one advanced research seminar that I taught last year that this wonderful little undergraduate um, wanted to take and I wasn't sure if she could keep up with the other graduate students but she did a phenomenal job and um, wrote an excellent paper and is now on a Fulbright in Bangladesh so I'm really proud of her mm -hmm. Shaina Hyder. Does, does all that publicity about this topic does that um, is that promoting student interest? I think so. Um, I see more and more students interested in health and in my department just last year we hired two new faculty members who are interested in aging and health health policy, health care issues. That's one of the strengths of the sociology department is the emphasis on, on these issues but also I'm a research associate in the Pepper Institute on Aging and Public Policy and everybody, that's an interdisciplinary research group and everybody in it is interested in some of these issues in one way or another. How can FSU and universities in Florida prepare themselves for all the changes coming in, in, in health care? Well, I think that you know we already have a great deal of strength there and are doing more hiring in these issues. And um, I think the big question is really, what is successful aging? How do we define successful aging? People don't want to live to be 100 years old if they're going to be in poor health and not be independent. Um, but yet one of the things we know is that sometimes staying independent means helping, accepting some help. And so I think our challenge is to learn how to design living situations um, to help people to stay in their own homes as long as possible to learn the best way to provide supportive services so they can do that but then when they need more help to design systems that um, will provide the maximum amount, amount of independence including issues like transportation, um, medical care and living arrangements. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Pro Professor Jill Quidagno. Uh, when we come back Dr. Barron and I will talk one-on-one -on -one about more issues in education. This is not a university presidency. This is the opportunity to take the Florida State University to the next level. We're attracting a student body that can go off and do great things. I like to get the job done. That's really what I'm about. Welcome back to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, sitting with Dr. Eric Barron, President of the Florida State University. 
Dr. Barron, we've been talking with Dr. Jill Quidogno, a professor of sociology. Um, what does it mean to have a professor like her become a fellow of the Institute of Medicine? Well, the, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine are recognized as the most outstanding group of, of people in those fields in the nation and people for which the, the federal government, Congress, and the president use to seek advice on important matters. And so to be elected is a recognition that you are in the tops of your field, in this case, in, in contributions to medicine. So that's a wonderful honor for the faculty member. It certainly brings prestige to the university. It helps us attract other outstanding scholars. And our students know that they're going to learn from the best. How do you encourage faculty members to incur to receive this to, to achieve this kind of recognition? So, you know, one of the things that, that we have is an office that is designed and should be working hard to make sure that our successful faculty are promoted by nomination to be fellow in a professional society or to get uh, some other award. But my overall feeling is that, that Florida State has an exceptional faculty and we don't do this as well as we should be doing it. The first, this is the first issues of uh, 2011. What are your New Year's goals for FSU this year? Okay, so it would be like saying budget, budget, budget. <laughs> we're, we're walking into a legislative session in which uh, the deficit for the state is growing. Uh, they will need to balance the budget. They're going to be looking at a lot of different places to do it. And we have the obligation to protect the quality of this institution. And I don't want to just hunker down and say, how do we protect ourselves? We need to make sure that even in the face of this, that we're advancing the institution. As you said, the, the state may not have the money to give the universities of Florida what they need to succeed. True. Does yeah. that mean you're not going to ask for any money? Or what are you going to ask for instead? Okay, so there are some things that we would very much like to have and uh, that are in the realm of possibility. The system is asking for dollars for New Florida, which supports uh, science, technology, engineering, and medical uh, advancement in, in the state universities. Um, there are things like that, but my personal feeling is um, to hold out my hand when I know the budgets are so tough, I would like to, ins you know, to hold my own but I think it would also be great if we had a little bit more freedom and flexibility to use the dollars we have to best purpose. Now, is that how you're, you've been talking a lot about big ideas lately? Mm -hmm. Is that how you're hoping to use some of the fund? Okay, so here, here's one thought. If you sit there and hunker down and you work to protect yourself, and you start coming out of uh, the economic doldrums, you start gearing up a fundraising campaign, um, are you going to be ready? Are you going to all of a sudden wake up and say, you know, uh, here's an opportunity. I guess I better go back to my uh, workbench and figure out how I'm going to approach that opportunity. This university should get ready now. Get ready now for when we do come out of the economic doldrums, but also be ready because we're not going to get donors to contribute to this university if we don't have ideas. So. The deans have been working on ideas, presenting them to all the other deans. Uh, I've solicited ideas from the faculty and staff. We've had a donor group, a friendly group of 55, come in and look at our ideas. And we have several that are emerging. One fits perfectly with the topic of this issue uh, in education. It's called an Institute for Successful Longevity. So here's the way to think about it. Imagine that we have a medical school for which gerontology is a specialty. We just heard about Jill's research in terms of, of uh, sociology and the importance of policy for, um, uh, for people that are, are, are growing older in our population. We have a psychology program that's exceptional, a neurology program that's exceptional, a nutrition program which becomes important, an exercise program that becomes important, a Claude Pepper Institute. Imagine putting it all together with the idea of greater physical and cognitive health as you grow older. And that's a big idea that would serve this state and this nation. Now, that kind of cross-disciplinary 
working together. That's very similar to the Pathways of Excellence idea, but how is that different and how does it help with fundraising? Okay, so the Pathways for Excellence was define, and a wonderful idea, define a particular area and do some cluster hires in that particular area. Now you're imagining how can you advance this area in more than one part of the university? What structure do you want to put in place that gets people to work together? And what is the list of things that you need in order to really do a great job? And this might be a group of ideas in terms of endowed chairs for which we would go to a donor. And it might be another set of positions for which as a state emerges that we go to the state. There might be another piece that would be something of interest to corporations or to foundations. So the big idea, what it takes to be really good at it, what are those pieces, what are those prices, what's the institutional structure to make it work well, and then go after the dollars. Uh, is there going to be a deadline to get all these big ideas in, or is this going to be an ongoing process? No, I think you've got to think about it as an ongoing process. But as we start a campaign for Florida State, which we will do in 2011, we need to have those big ideas in our pockets. We want sociology to have that idea, we want the college to have their ideas, and we want these big ideas across the university because we'll find people that want to contribute at a variety of different levels. One of the, uh, at least one of the other Florida universities in an attempt to raise tuition have said that over the next 10 years they're going to bring um, 20,000 more students onto their campus, Florida International University, and that's an increase of 50% for them. Mm -hmm. Is that something FSU is considering doing, and what kind of challenges are there for that? Or, or, or not. I mean, if you think about it, there's only certain ways in which we can change our income base. Um, the state can give us more, we can increase tuition, we can increase the number of students, we can do more online education, we can have a greater mix of out-of-state students that pay more, we can do more in philanthropy. So every university in the state has been suffering these budget cuts and they're all looking for revenues. So one university in the state at least has decided more students is the way for us to get revenues. And uh, the downside is it puts stress on their faculty and on their physical plant. We don't have plans to do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. That's our time for now. Please join us again next month for more Issues in Education. You can watch the premiere episode of Issues in Education the first Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. That means you can see the next new episode on Wednesday, February 2nd on WFSU TV. Join us as we discuss the latest developments in higher education happening around the state and across the country. If you have questions that you would like us to address on this program, you can email us at issues at wfsu.org. Again, that's issues at wfsu.org. If you would like to see past episodes of Issues in Education, head to the President's website at president.fsu.edu. I'm Suzanne Smith with the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron, for Issues in Education. We'll see you next time.